welcome everyone. We're happy you're here. And welcome, Mark Namath. Thank you. I just like to say that, um, that Americans always impress me by how they do actually come and see things. <laughs> um, in England, as I once wrote, if your um, favorite living writer, who also happened to be your long lost twin brother, was giving a reading in the next house along, it wouldn't even occur to you to go and stick your head around the door. <laughs> Not as true now as it was then, but that's the difference between them. I thought we would begin with the title of your new novel. It's such a powerful, evocative phrase. I wonder if you could talk about that. Um, well, it has sort of three levels. The zone of interest was what uh, the Nazis called the Greater Auschwitz Area. And as we'll no doubt will uh, have more to say about this, that um, interest is there not because it's interesting, but because it makes money. Um, the cupidity and rapacity of the Nazis in this project, the Holocaust, um, is beyond belief uh, and compounds the, the crime. It also refers to the zone of interest is he, in his view, is what someone really is. And um, if you read the testimonies of the survivors, it's something that comes up again and again, that, um, that no one knows themselves. And until they're in an extreme situation, um, you know, in normal, peaceful, civilized life, you only are aware of about 10% of your resources and, and your deeper personality. But in, in, in an atrocity producing context, you find out amazing things about yourself, both the perpetrators and the victims. And the other thing is that um, the zone of interest is how I feel about the whole subject in that um, W.G. Sebald said that um, no serious person ever thinks about anything else. <laughs> and it was meant to be an ironic guy aside, but I think there's a level on which he meant it. And um, there's a level on which I mean it too, that um, it is not just the magnitude of the crime, but the inexplicability <coughs> of the crime and, uh, and of Hitler. Um, and of the German people. Um, no historian claims to understand Hitler, and most of them make a point of saying that they don't. And some, like Alan Bullock, say that the more, more he learns about Hitler, the fight harder he finds it to understand. And Ron Rosenbaum wrote a terrific book called Explaining Hitler that doesn't, I mean, there is, <laughs> there is no explanation. Um, nor will there be. And he, he has a chapter where he said he imagines possible revelations that you know, could explain it, and actually none of them do. Uh, none of them could. So I can't imagine uh, ever losing my horrified fascination when regarding this subject. This is your second novel about the Holocaust. The first was Time's Arrow um, in the early 90s. It's a beautiful novel which runs in reverse, kind of like a film. It, it's in reverse time. Um, and it was suggested to me by Robert J. Lifton's book, The Nazi Doctors. I wanted to do something in reverse time, as, as other writers have done, Philip K. Dick and in, indeed Scott Fitzgerald, um, and Isaac Bashevis Singer as well. Um, and I thought, yes, but what's the point? And then I thought, if you tell this story backwards, it's um, some amazing things happen because the arrow of time turns out to be the arrow of morality with amazing consistency. Um, so that the story of the Holocaust becomes a kind of sordid miracle in that it's very dirty and smelly, but what you're doing is creating a race summoning them down from the heavens, fattening them up, um, and then returning them to their homes. Uh, so it, it becomes a beneficent act. And backwards in time means backwards in morality. For instance, um, 
if a child is crying violently uh, in a backward reel, imagine just a film going backwards, the child is crying violently and you slap it across the face and then it's happy again. And it's like that 100% of the time, uh, that, that uh, to invert time is to invert morality. But I thought this th on this occasion, um, the idea came to me, um, and it was, an, it was a, a naturalistic idea. And I, I thought, it, if, I go, if I do write a full-length novel, if it turns out to be a full-length novel and not a story, as I thought it was going to be, then I would, social realism would be the genre, not a fantastic flight, you know. It's very powerful, so effective. So you come back to this subject. Clearly, you've spent years reading history. I mean, deep, deep reading, which you um, revealed to us, share with us at the end of the zone of interest. What is it that fiction can do that all those other books do not? What compelled you to try again, well, to again write about the Holocaust in a, in a very particular way in this novel? Well, um, there are very respectable and distinguished people who say that you shouldn't write about the Holocaust. Um, George Steiner, Cynthia Ozick, and others. But that makes no, it's slightly self-righteous, I find, to say that. Um, and it also makes no philosophical sense and no literary critical sense. At what point does uh, a historical event become in, unvisitable by, you know, Arbeit macht frei, it says on the gates of Auschwitz, and also underneath, uh, poets and novelists not welcome. Um, I mean, it, um, it's the Holocaust and Nazi Germany is the worst thing that's happened yet. It's the terminal point of uh, human evil and, um, and it demolished the image of man for um, while it was taking place. But I, I for, for instance, if in the Middle East the ISIS phenomenon uh, suddenly exploded and became what it has the potential to become um, mass genocide in every direction um, and say the numbers were as great. Um, at what stage, at what moment does it um, exclude itself? Does it become extraterritorial for writers? Um, makes no sense. But I do think that uh, there are s special responsibilities involved when you do write about it. Um, not qualitatively different from any act of writing, because um, always you're battling with um, finding the right tone for the tone and words for events you're describing. But um, the, the tension is unusually sharp when you're writing about something as atrocious as this. The tone in the zone of interest is it, it begins almost idyllically, romantically. Um, there's an element, it's a romance, you think, for a moment. That was, well, novels start not with a de decision, as so many people think. Why did you decide to write? Um, that sounds to me like a description of writer's block, when you have to decide to write something. <laughs> uh, it comes in the form of a throb or a shiver, um, a frisson. And you, you, you recognize the feeling, and you know that here is, here is a bit of fiction offering itself to you to be written. You don't know that how long it's going to be. It could be just a very short, short story. But um, you accept that uh, donné. And um, I, could, I could never sort of disobey that feeling. That I, if it's there for me to write. It is more as if it's chosen you rather than you've chosen it. And you had so much knowledge to draw on for this particular subject that you've read so much. Um, so I wonder if you could, um, well, we talked about you reading a, a portion. Let's start with that and then we'll talk about the language. And okay, and this is it's just a page, just under a page, and it's um, 
the uh, it's what I started with in my mind. It was the do the free song, and um, I exhausted it in one page. Uh, <laughs> no. And, and you get started, and then you see what's there, and uh, sometimes, and it's a wonderful feeling um, that it all seems to be there waiting for you. Um, as Auden said, uh, writing a poem, uh, that it's like, it's like uh, rubbing away on an old tablet until the words are formed, but the words seem to have been there from ancient times. Um, the chapter one, the zone of interest, one, Thompson, first sight. I was no stranger to the flash of lightning. I was no stranger to the thunderbolt. Enviably experienced in these matters, I was no stranger to the cloudburst. The cloudburst and then the sunshine and the rainbow. She was coming back from the old town with her two daughters, and they were already well within the zone of interest. Up ahead, waiting to receive them, stretched an avenue of maples, their branches and lobe leaves interlocking overhead. A late afternoon in midsummer, with minutely glinting midges. My notebook lay open on a tree stump, and the breeze was flicking inquisitively through its pages. Tall, broad, and full, and yet light of foot, in a crenellated white ankle-length dress and a cream-colored straw hat with a black band and swinging a straw bag. The girls, also in white, had the straw hats and the straw bags. She moved in and out of pockets of fuzzy, fawny, leonine warmth. She laughed, head back, with tautened throat. Moving in parallel, I kept pace in my tailored tweed jacket and twills with my clipboard my fountain pen. Now the three of them crossed the drive of the Equestrian Academy. Teasingly circled by her children, she moved past the ornamental windmill, the maypole, the three-wheel gallows, the cart horse, slackly tethered to the iron pump, and then moved beyond, into the cat set, into cat set one. Something happened at first sight. Lightning, thunder, cloudburst, sunshine, rainbow, the meteorology of first sight. Mm, thank you. So here's a. <laughs> so here's a, a beautiful scene a man looking at a woman and, and falling in some sort of maybe infatuation or love. Yeah, it, it's, um, it doesn't turn into love till sort of halfway through the novel. It, it, it soon modulates into lust. Um, and she's the commandant's wife. Right. So it's a very rash uh, flirtation he undertakes because um, he is well protected. He is the nephew of Martin Bormann, Hitler's private secretary, who some said was the, the third most p powerful man in the Reich. Um, so he has a measure of protection. But in a, in a universe like the concentration camp, um, with such pressure of death everywhere, it would be, be very easy for the commandant to, to direct death in his direction. Uh, this is Golo we're talking about. Is that yes. Yeah. Um, well, I wanted to mention the subtlety of what you do in the end of that description, where we see an ornamental windmill, a maypole, these are lovely things, and then the three-wheeled gallows. Yeah, that, that's the only anomaly and that, that was what it, it, you know, stimulated me, was the idea of um, a love affair or, or just a, a moment of deep attraction and admiration and feeling of humility um, uh, it, against this um, violently anomalous background. That was what, that's how the novel began in my mind. Mm -hmm. The other interesting element in that scene is the notebook, which is a very sensual object, and it immediately gives us a little question about this Nazi who looks the part. He's the most Aryan character in you. He certainly cast. looks the part. He's um, unlike the leaders of the Reich, 
Yeah, he was six foot three and blonde and blue eyed, um, and and aggressively uh, put together. And whereas, I mean, uh, uh, Goering looks like a burger, fat burger out of Buddenbrooks, and Heydrich looks like a Nazi. But all the others are sort of pathetic mishmash of Baltic, uh, Danubian, uh, you know, uh, hybrids. Uh, <laughs> they all have the, um, Golo and his friend Boris, and we'll get to Boris, have nicknames for all of you. Guys. Yeah, um, <laughs> well, I made those up. I mean, <laughs> they all hated each other, too. Um, I mean, the, those under Hitler all hated each other and vied jealously for his attention and time. So Martin Bormann calls um, Goebbels the cripple, um, Rosenberg the masturbator, uh, Goering the transvestite, and Himmler the quack. <laughs> uh. So here's Golo um, setting himself this incredibly risky mission of trying to seduce the commandant's wife. And he keeps a notebook. And that sort of signals to us that he's a thinking person. And you've had characters in other books, um, Desmond and Lionel Asbo, for instance. And it, it seems to imply that paying attention and, and writing about things has some sort of moral orientation. In, yes, in it's, it's not clear that he's um, got any artistic leanings. And in fact, um, his, his job, he's a sort of troubleshooter for his uncle. And his job is to monitor the progress of um, Auschwitz III. Um, uh, I.G. Farben, a world famous um, cartel at the time, built its own concentration camp at Auschwitz in the village of Monowitz three or four miles from the main camps. Um, and in a quest to produce um, synthetic rubber and synthetic fuel at huge expense, uh, built what was meant to be the most uh, advanced and biggest plant in, in Europe. Um, and got through 30,000 Jewish slaves who died building this factory. Um, and, were, and its executives were prosecuted after the war and got for, for slavery and despoliation and mass murder and got very light sentences, which were all, re seven years, which were all reduced. But um, uh, this, it's as, as far as business has ever gone into, um, into you know, slave, slave driving uh, and murder. And that, that leads to another aspect of this novel, which is so unusual and um, disturbing, which is that it's sort of about a logistical nightmare, a bureaucratic chaos. And the problem is not the factory, which fails completely, but rather the disposal of corpses. Um, yes, Dell says that corpses are the bane of his life. Um, Dell and, and the commandant. Yeah. You know, I didn't make anything up. Um, except about their private lives, these characters. Um, but in 1942, they, the order was given in the summer of 1942. And it was just up, it was during a, an incredibly fierce typhus e epidemic in the camp with 10,000 dying a week, right into September, uh, October. Um, they were given an order that they had to exhume all the corpses they're disposed of by burying them in a meadow. And uh, what happens is that the, the, the putrefaction gets into the water table. And um, he's summoned, Paul Dole is summoned by the town elders of Auschwitz town. And uh, they tell him that you can't uh, drink the water no matter how, how many times you boil it. Um, so they have to exhume all these bo bodies, and they ha have no real idea how many there are. And um, uh, it turns out that there were, and this is in Paul, uh, 
Rudolf Hess's autobiography, Commandant of Auschwitz, which he wrote in his death cell in Poland, 45, 46, there were 107,000 corpses in that field. Mm -hmm. And uh, the field was sort of popping and squirting with this putrefaction. And, uh, and the bodies were themselves sort of um, mostly liquid by that time. And, uh, what a task. And, uh, and it's, it's, it's very anomalous, and I haven't seen any historian questioning this, but why, why were they digging them up and burning them and grinding the bones? And it was to remove the evidence. Um, and one of the Nazis says, why are we getting all namby-pamby about it now? Surely we're going to be doing a lot more of this sort of thing, and it won't matter when we win. But um, by even by 1942, it was dawning on them that the fantastic crimes legalized by Germany were still illegal elsewhere, and that a, a great retribution was due to them, and they sensed that. But it, it's still um, strange that at, at so early on they did that. The war was, in fact, lost in December 41 when the attack on Russia collapsed. And in the war diary, the Wehrmacht war diary, it says the Führer has already acknowledged that no victory can be gained. And four days later, Hitler uh, declared war on the USA, uh, just after Pearl Harbor. He was under no obligation to do that. And, and in fact, the only, the only way you can see Hitler co co coherently is that thereafter, his hatred and his aggression veered in on a new target, Germans. And he said at the time, in, um, I shall shed no tears for the German people if they're not strong enough to stake their blood, uh, then let, let them be destroyed. I, I shall not grieve for them. And uh, his actions, subsequent actions in the war, 1944, late in 1944, his last military effort was in the West, not in the East, against the Russians. He wanted the Russians uh, to, he opened the door to the Russians because he knew they were how uh, enraged and, um, and brutal they would be. And uh, they were an army of rapists, as one witness said. Um, even even the, the higher officers were rapists. And it might uh, interest that Republican senator who said recently, or congressman who said recently that um, when a woman is raped, her reproductive functions close down. Uh, he might try telling that to the million uh, Ill, uh, rape victim babies that were born uh, in 1946. Yes, but that's facts. That's fact, that's yeah. Fact. Um, so there's, we have three voices in this novel that give us three perspectives. Um, one is Golo, the other is Paul Dahl, the commandant, and then the other is, um, I'm not sure how to pronounce his name, Shmuel? Shmuel, yes. Shmuel, who's Jewish and who is helping with the corpse problem. Um, he has stayed alive um, and worked. Well, well, he's the leader of the Sonder Commando, um, uh, the most fantastically degraded people in the history of the world. Uh, they were the, the Jews who agreed by, to prolong their lives for a couple of weeks, two or three weeks, by disposing of the corpses, A, and B, by um, helping to deceive the, the prisoners when they arrived, by saying reassuring things and, uh, and giving a, a picture of normality. Um, in a, Schmuel says, he has three reasons for, three excuses for going on living, uh, to bear witness, and in fact his pages are something that he does actually write and buries in a child's galosh in the commandant's garden. And the, as were many testimonies were, were found buried in the camps. Um, that's one. Two, to um, exact revenge. 
and he, he, do, he doesn't know if it's in him, but he intends to kill a powerful Nazi uh, just before he dies. And they're under no illusion because um, their, their first act as a sonder is to cremate their predecessors. Um, and the third uh, reason is, and it's something that Primo Levi, who, who is, in my view, the great uh, Delphic voice on this subject, uh, Primo Levi wrote a, a very nuanced essay on the Sonder Commando in uh, The Drowned in the Sea. But there was something he, he did, didn't seem to know about the Sonders, that they occasionally served, saved a life. Um, they would go up to young boys, teenage boys, and they would say very meaningly, you are 18 years old and you have a trade. So when they came to the selection on the ramp, and by the way, 80% of those who went to Auschwitz were never tattooed, they were killed within an hour. Um, and so the, the, the boy would say, instead of saying I'm 16 and I'm a schoolboy, they would say I'm 18 and I'm a carpenter and that would get them past the selection. Um, and there's also a scene which I used um, in, a, in a witness's testimony. There were on the ramp uh, a family group, 20-year-old woman, a 30-year-old man, um, and a 50-year-old woman. And the 20-year-old had a, a boy, a child in arms. And Schmuel goes up to him and says, you know, believe me, uh, trust me, take the child from its, his mother and give him to his grandmother. And then when they come and exact, uh, the doctors give them a cursory glance, it's all done in a second, and points left or right, um, uh, two and not th three are condemned to death. Um, you know, any woman with a child would be certainty for the gas. So, and any able-bodied um, woman of it, 20, would be admitted to the work details. So that kind of, um, it's, it's not quite like Sophie's Choice because it's not a choice made by, by them. It's uh, just a fact of, it, the Nazi doctors are just looking at, at the, prisoners from an ergonomic point of view. And by the way, in addition, the, the doctors were not, when we think of a Nazi doctor, we think of Mengele and experiments on twins. That's just a, 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 a detail. Um, the doctors were involved at every stage of the killing, the Zyklon B, the gas pellets, um, oversaw the disposal of the corpses, made the selections as to who would live, who would die. And uh, Robert J. Lifton said that, that um, it was in essence a biomedical vision, that uh, the rationale was that you cut out the cancerous um, organ of jury and then the, nas the, the, the health of the nation will flourish as a result. Mm. Such insanity, such opacity as you used that. Yes, word. and yeah. uh, really incomprehensible on every level, I think. So you, you're so steeped in this. You, you know all this history so well. And yet this novel it does not feel like kind of a traditional historical novel. You don't, you're not really giving us this kind of facts. The story moves. It's very personal. A lot of the worst things happen off to the side, kind of outside the frame. Uh, so I wonder how that, um, as you're writing and, and revising, how you kind of distilled this down to these voices and, and what we do see, which is so intimate, really. Well, um, the, the, um, the other characters th are thinking about something else most of the time, right. um, about their appointed tasks. And it's only in the character of Schmuel that I, I felt I was really confronting it directly, and that's why Schmuel has much less space than the others. Uh, what I was terrified of um, is you know, what Primo Levi, in describing an Italian novel about the 
Holocaust, where he said, I was appalled by the amount of literary lechery in this book, where there's a sort of uh, uh, ex exaltation um, in the horror of it. And I, right. I, I dreaded um, trying, I, I didn't want any sort of poetic summoning of, of the horror of it. Um, but it couldn't, in the end, be entirely avoided. But, but again, this was, it, I got going, and then I thought, no, we need more than one narrator. And then I immediately thought, no, actually, we need three. And uh, it, it sort of, the big decisions in, in writing a novel um, are all made unconsciously, and, and uh, you don't think about them at all. You just follow your instinct, and there it is. Interesting. Um, I find that your novels really benefit from repeated reading, to, to reread. So much comes out. There's so much that goes on in these books. And I wonder if in your reading of literature and the writers that you embrace, including Chicago's own Saul Bellow, if that's kind of a standard for how books um, stand the test of time, if that's what lasts. Well, the, the, um, that's, that's very mysterious. <laughs> Nabokov said, funnily, funnily enough, you cannot read a novel. You can only reread a novel. Um, because you would, if you listen to a piece of music, you wouldn't think that that was the end of the experience. Right. You have to know what to expect as you begin. So um, you have to know the shape. I also think that a, a novel should, should be perfectly uh, assimilable just from one reading. Mm -hmm. It's not everyone who's going to go back, but um, the, the really good readers do go back. Um, and I, I spend more of my time now rereading fiction than, f than discovering fiction. Um, and I read the dead because, uh, as you suggested just now, there's only, only really one measure of literary uh, excellence, and that is the passage of time. 90% um, of of book reviewing and criticism uh, is, is just op opinion dressed up um, as, as logic. And in fact, all, all the words of praise, <laughs> all the words of praise are, are preference or, or, or saying he, he's not positive enough, enough about life, say. Um, that's, a, that's a preference synonym. And all, all the disparaging remarks are also uh, just other ways of saying I didn't like it. Um, I think in poetry, memorability is, uh, is probably an indication of, and some poets are instantly unforgettable, and that, that is surely an indicator of something. Um, and uh, yielding more on a second reading is certainly would be, seem to be an indicator of of quality, although my father would have been very <laughs> impatient with the idea that you have to reread a novel. But then again, Kingsley, my father was, um, actually had very lowbrow tastes in fiction. Uh, he, he, poetry was his thing, and he knew uh, all of English poetry by heart, basically. But um, he read thrillers. Um, and he once said to me later on in life, he said, I'm never going to read a novel again unless it begins, a, a shot rang out. <laughs> you've, had such, <clears throat> you've had such a literary life. I mean, growing up, with your father was a writer. Uh, you've been writing a long time. And you've written tremendous literary criticism. Um, are, and I was reading um, your Introduction to the War Against the Cliché, which is, that's been around, that's been a while now since it came out. And you were talking about how that used the connection between literature and society used to be a very urgent matter. Liter and literary criticism in society, yeah. 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 Um, yeah, that's all disappeared now. It's dead. 
Um, and I, I'm sure I say in rather facetiously in that introduction that what killed literary criticism as a living force that people talked about a lot um, was OPEC. In 1973, um, when the oil hike came and was uh, intensified at the end of that decade, um, but previously you, you could live you know, on 10 shillings a week in London. Um, but then suddenly a bus fare cost 10 shillings. And literary criticism, which I think, as Clive James said, is not necessary to literature, but it's necessary to civilization. Mm -hmm. but, but it did, um, it, it, it revealed itself as a sort of frippery, as a luxury that we could no longer afford. Mm. And yet, it seems that we really do need stories. We need literature. Stories. Need, yeah. Yeah, I think um, Zadie Smith, who's thir late 30s, said to me, um, literature as we know it will last, my will last your time, she said, but I don't think it'll last mine. Mm. Well, I wonder. Um, it seems, I mean. But I think, I mean. Then it will go back to what it was when I started out, which is a, a minority interest sphere. Yeah. And I, you know, no one minded it being that in 1970. <laughs> and all, all that happened was that um, in the year 1980, um, the, suddenly in England anyway, and elsewhere I'm sure, the media reached a sort of critical mass and the, the newspapers were not just big on Sunday, but on Saturday and every day. And they simply, the newspapers simply ran out of uh, ne'er-do-well royals and uh, <laughs> depressive comedians and um, adulterous golfers and <laughs> rapist boxers and, uh, and found themselves to their horror writing about writers. <laughs> And suddenly it did become more than a minority interest sphere. But it, the worst that can happen is that it'll go back to that and uh, anyone who cares about it will still be, want to do it. And those who, uh, I think it's a fairly deep human need to be told stories, um, that there will always be an audience for that, perhaps not as, as of the size there is now. I'll ask one more question before we turn it over to the audience. And, and that's about um, the depth and richness of language. I mean, this is the age of Twitter and texting, and, and sort of language is code more than actual language. And yeah. I, I wonder if you could talk about writing the way you write now. With a well, um, uh, I, I thought style would have to very much retreat from this novel. But uh, looking at it now, and the only time I, in the old days, uh, an evening alone with a bottle of wine and an eight, year, eight hour read of me seemed like the perfect evening. <laughs> but, uh, but now I only do it um, because the future is getting smaller and the past is getting bigger and you have to head forward. And I only do it when the book comes out. And, Various things have surprised me looking again at it. And the, the style is, I hope, you know, doesn't, doesn't vaunt itself at all. But it, the, you know, every, every sentence has a sort of minimum elegance, I hope, and euphony. And really, the process is, um, is uh, saying the sentence, subvocalizing it in your head until there's nothing wrong with it. The, the, but this means n n not repeating in the same sentence suffix suffixes and prefixes. If you've got a con confound, you can't have a conform. Um, if you've got invitation, you can't have execution. Um, you can't repeat those, end, uh, or an ing, or a ness. Um, all that has to be one per sentence. And uh, I think the prose will give a sort of pleasure without you being able to tell why. That's what I hope. Oh, beautiful. 
Um, write that down. Write it down. <laughs> <laughs> Tremendous advice. Thank you so much. Thank you. Well, now I can see you. Not the lights. So we have good people with microphones. You've written about Stalin, Koba the Dread. Is there any? Sorry, you talk. You've written about Stalin in the book Koba the Dread, correct? Um, is there anything worthwhile to compare Stalin and Hitler? Uh, you know, oh, I, I think it's um, very interesting, Stalin and Hitler, and um, many vast differences. But the one, I, the one that's been fascinating me recently, and I'm sort of writing something about it, is that uh, the impenetrability of Hitler ha has to do with the fact that he's a sort of sexual void. And um, sexuality... Uh, without knowing any details, uh, is how we recognize each other. It's such a hum basic human thing. And, um, and oddly enough, when a character appears in a novel you're writing, you know exactly all about their sexuality without thinking about it. It's a subconscious sort of apprehension you have about them. Um, and uh, Stalin is completely recognizable type. Uh, he had three legitimate children, at least as many by blows, um, was a tr seniorial womanizer and slept with many a colleague's wife. Who, he liked them young. He knocked up a 13-year-old in Siberia in exile and, uh, and then knocked her up again when she was 14 and got into a bit of trouble with uh, the local gendarmerie. Um, but there's nothing... There's a certain sort of um, sans-culotte uh, revolutionary Puritanism that emerges later in his life. And in the intra-party phase of the Great Terror in 37, 38, if you were a promiscuous wife or a promiscuous husband, uh, you were much more likely to be um, shot and beaten um, during the Terror. But, um, but with Hitler, there's nothing. There's... Uh, there are, in fact, three schools of thought about his sexuality, um, normality, asexuality, and perversion. Now, I, th I think we can rule out normality, don't you? <laughs> uh, the idea of Eva Brown uh, in huskily enjoying a post-coital cigarette while H Hitler towels himself down <laughs> after a uh, very uh, caring and inventive session in bed. Nah. <laughs> Absolutely impossible. Um, the perversion route, uh, invariably, writers who, who, psychiatrists and psychohistorians and historians themselves, uh, in, c come up with the most disgusting things you can possibly imagine. Um, but I think it was, he, he was, I call him, an, among many uh, paraphrastic ways of talking about him without actually naming him. Um, I think he, the, the petty bourgeois antichrist um, that he was, as well as being the vegetarian Tyrannosaurus Rex and, <laughs> and the virgin Priapus, I think my hunch is that um, when Ava Brown came this has only recently been revealed, when she came to visit him at the Berghof in the mountains, um, he had to get an injection from his doctor of bull semen. Now, I, whether the bull semen worked is a completely open question. No one has any idea. But I imagine, I'm not going to be a tease, so I'll tell you what my hunch is, it, um, is that he would fortify his underpants with many layers of... Um, napkins and serviettes, and then um, achieve some sort of state of excitation while, at a safe distance, Eva Brown did something like raise her skirt. <laughs> um, and then there would be some, with skipping the tumescent stage, there would be some sort of soggy climax. <laughs> um, that's my sort of novelist hunch about it. <laughs> uh, but no, there are huge differences. Uh, I mean, Stalin, Stalin was on uh, ideological rails and uh, 
any one of those leaders who stuck to the Marxist idea and the Leninist idea would have more or less had to do what he did. The terror is, the great terror is, is anomalous, but the, um, the collectivization of the peasantry, which involved a terror famine in, in Ukraine, deliberate famine that killed eight or nine million people in, with a cruelty that compares with the Holocaust. You have to watch your, your family starving. And uh, Vasily Grossman wrote a brilliant short novel about this. Uh, everything flows, where he says, you know, it's horrible to read that some mothers ran away screaming from their children in, in the second weeks of starvation. Um, others um, killed their children and ate them, but others were um, sweet and tender right to the end and told them stories and tried to keep them. Um, but Hitler, there was no, and, and Stalin had to do that to break the peasantry. And otherwise, you just abandon the socialist experiment and you become a sort of a bourgeois nation. And they weren't going to do that. Um, but there's, there's absolutely no casus belli in Hit, Hitler's case. There's no re reason why he did what he did to the huge detriment of the war effort um, and for, for no uh, even vaguely rational goal in mind, whereas Stalin always had a sort of just about rational goal at every stage. I sort of had a theory about your writing which I wanted to test out on you and see if you have any response to, uh, which is that it occurs to me that um, experience, your memoir, is a kind of hinge in your writing um, career. It seems to me that something happens in experience where your extraordinarily finely tuned ironic style, which you know, had sort of been much in evidence all along, confronts a kind of intractability of personal experience, which then perhaps has a tr transformative effect on the novels that follow. And I'm, I'm wondering if I'm just making that up, or if, <laughs> or if in fact the, you know, the experience of accounting for experience had, a, had an effect on your, um, on your literary writing that followed? Well, yeah, someone, someone called experience a 400-page crying jag. Um, <laughs> I hope it's not quite that, but there was certainly a lot more emotion than had been easily evident earlier on. Um, I, I would claim that the emotion has always been there, but, but um, sort of sublimated up to a point. And I, I think that thereafter, my novels did more, more receptive to emotion and, um, and more c candid about it, perhaps. So you're onto something. <laughs> so it was a very interesting answer about Stalin and Hitler. My question is, uh, do you see any similarity between Hitler and Putin? And Putin life, sexual life, is total enigma. <laughs> Nobody knows if he has sex, at least Hitler way or any way other. Putin and Putin, Hitler. yeah, and Hitler and Hitler. And Hitler. Right. Um, no, I'd see a Putin and Stalin more, um, and he does think that the collapse of the Soviet Union was the the greatest um, political tragedy of all time, and. Uh, you know, never underestimate how much um, politics has to do with face, um, with prestige. And to go from a superpower to the plaything of a lot of Chicago economists, Mil Milton Friedman and the rest of them, was a, was a horrible humiliation for, for Russia. And um, that is not forgotten and um, simmers away. I succeeded in infuriating Gary Kasparov, the chess uh, prodigy and w world champion who's been involved in politics and uh, in Russia and has felt the, the brunt of Putin's disfavor. And it, it, nothing too brutal. It's more like what Nixon used to do to his political enemies, which is you give them an audit, you know, and then give them another audit. 
But what I said was, and I, perhaps it was rather frivolous, but I said, um, and it was just as the Ukraine thing was boiling up, but no troops on the ground, no Russian troops in evidence at that point. And I said, do you think he's just, um, he's waiting for a moment when he can n make an exit that, um, that will save prestige? That's all he cares about. And Kasparov, it was quite marvelous to see his eyes flooded with rage uh, in a quite primitive way. And he said, um, I'm shocked. He said, that, don't you realize that he's not going to stop Putin? And he then, Indeed, he turned out to be right. That does seem to be something. He, he's launched himself um, into this thing, and he's going to go, as, you know, to the last mile. I, I think what well, Russia has always been not a nation state, but a state nation. It's um, the glory of the state is what it's always been about for the last millennia, ever since Russia existed as an entity, and. Um, that's what Putin is thinking about, the glory of the state. But Ukraine became true of Zorba. It's very paradoxical because they take on the Russian TV direct, kill Ukraine. This has never happened before like this. And this is similar to Hitler propaganda rather than Stalin, to never say the other thing. That uh, the Ukraine. Yeah. yeah. The Ukraine has um, that Timothy Schneider book, Bloodlands has been the scene of um, unimaginable suffering in the last century. And uh, the great resentment that, um, that it ceased to be part of the Soviet Union. And I think it was huge folly, as, and James Baker, in the last months of his life, said to offer them NATO ma membership is just uh, an insane provocation. And now we see his response to it. Well, I think we're out of time. Thank you all so much for being here. And we'll Thank you. Thank you very much.